She's done some work for me, yay too. Um, she is a transplant to the Riverside area from Minnesota and has established a vibrant secular community in the area. Jill has also taught theater at the Redlands E Academy and directed community plays. She was a former English teacher at Australia Center Maiden. 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 I, I, I know I'm going to mispronounce this. <laughs> Who's that? In Formasi? What you say? In Indonesia. Okay, in <laughs> Indonesia. Um, she sings in a local secular chorus, the Redlands Festival Singers, who perform several times a year in the Redlands area. She's a mom of two, and she stays quite busy. So please, please welcome Jill to, uh, to IEA. Question 
from my friends was, by the way, what's the size of Red Lens? And every time I answered about 65,000, I couldn't help but notice I was becoming increasingly concerned. <laughs> I wondered if it was going to be unbearably conservative. I soothed myself by concentrating on everything central Minnesota lacked that our new home in Southern California would have. Mountains, ocean, desert, nice weather, especially nice weather. <laughs> and, I, and I reminded myself that I not only love the challenge and excitement that a move brings, but I'm also good at it. I've lived in a lot of different places before moving to California, and I'd never not be able, been able to thrive in a new environment. I was brimming with confidence. All the heart of the fall then, when months later I found myself still struggling. The most frustrating area of all involved my children. I realized that up until this moment, they hadn't faced many obstacles in their lives. We'd always lived in a community of like-minded people, so they never had to confront firsthand individuals whose positions in nearly every major category, government, climate, education, and religion, were so fundamentally different from their own. For the first time in their lives, my two boys, as liberal atheists in a conservative and religious town, were forced to face what it feels like to be a minority experiencing adversity head on. For about the first six months, although I never showed it, I felt a fair amount of sympathy for them. As a parent, I was a cuddler, but I was not a coddler, and I was proud of that. But the truth is that up until the move to Redlands, when Hank and Levi were just 10 and eight, I truly had never been in a challenging enough situation as a parent in which my refusal to overprotect them was legitimately put to the test. Suddenly it was, and I found myself wanting to respond like the snowplow parent, who, in an effort to eliminate all suffering and struggling, flattens every obstacle in their children's way. This is an effort to make the road to adulthood as smooth and painless as possible every step of the way. It's especially hard not to do this when you're certain that their sadness is your fault. When my husband and I moved here, they didn't have a choice. They left behind a life that was extremely full, an amazing school, a park packed with children, a neighborhood packed with children. I berated myself for allowing this move to happen. From the get-go, Redlands reminded me of the stifling town I'd grown up in precisely the kind of place I never in a thousand years imagined I would be raising my own children. Yet, here we were. So funnily enough, out of all the different types of people in the world that I have always found annoying, those who gripe about the place they live and the people who reside there, to me are some of the most annoying and pitiful individuals around, and the last thing I wanted was to be that kind of a person. I was determined to find a way to be happy and deduce that the first step in coming up with the solution was to set aside the more petty reasons why I didn't like Redlands. The fact that it has a beautiful but tiny library, that there's only one coffee shop in town I can even halfway describe as hip, that the airport, <laughs> the closest airport is 45 minutes away, and that there's so few community theaters. But I had to set those aside in order to uncover the true source of my dissatisfaction. And when I did that, I discovered that really what was wrong was that my boys and I were terribly lonely. The perfect weather, the gorgeous landscape, the safety of the town, the politeness of folks, none of that means anything if you feel utterly disconnected from your community. For isolation is a killer. So now that I got to the root of the problem, I felt I could fix it. Problem solving was something I always felt pretty confident about. So I focused, because I'm a mom, on my kids' loneliness first. Because we'd only moved two months before the end of the school year, 
My plan was to see if I could connect with a few parents before summer so that our children could play together during the eight-week break. The school in Minneapolis provided a directory which consists of every student's name, along with their parent's name, physical address, email, and phone number. And of course it wasn't mandatory, mandatory to submit this information, but I actually never knew of a single parent who didn't because it was such a slick way of connecting to the other parents and then their kids. But unfortunately, their new school did not have a directory. So instead, I found myself writing notes to the parents of whoever my kids expressed even a mild interest in. <laughs> I introduced myself as Hank and Levi's mom. I began each short letter by mentioning that our kids seemed to hit it off with their kids and that I'd love for them to get together outside of school. I offered to pick them up and bring them home, and I included my name, email, and address. I was desperate to make a connection. And that's why I made these play dates as easy for the other parents as possible. I put the notes in envelopes, I gave them to Hank and Levi, who handed them to the kids that they liked, who hopefully delivered the note to their parents. Let's just say it didn't work. <laughs> I tried showing up early, before and after school, so that I could meet some parents face to face. I'd ask my boys to point out which kid they were having fun with, and then I'd follow that kid so that I could say hi to the mom or dad. I'd just say, hi, my name's Jill, my kids seem to be hitting it off, the same things I wrote in the notes. But none of the parents were interested in adding more people to their lives. They weren't mean about it, but every one of them said no thank you. So I asked my boys to ask their classmates what they usually do on the weekends. And the answer was overwhelmingly that they went to church and spent time with relatives. I tried more things, a soccer team, swim club, but every time the situation was the same. My kids found the other kids dull. I mean, not ever mean, but just kind of dull. And at this point, my older child just told me to stop trying. <laughs> my desire for him and his brother to make friends as dynamic as the ones they had back home was starting to feel like pressure on them. So although it wasn't my nature, I took a break from the boys, took solace in the fact that they at least had each other, and decided to focus on myself. I thought that if I could just get lucky, if I could just somehow bump into one person whose life wasn't entirely wrapped up in Jesus, it would be the break I needed in, insofar as ending this too, too quiet existence that I was living. I fantasized about how it would go. By some miracle, we'd recognize that the other person didn't worship a God either. We decide that this connection alone was enough for us to like each other. Next, he or she would introduce me to their God-free friends, and on and on until my life was bursting with informed and enlightened people, some of whom would surely have kids of their own for my kids to play with. But almost a year went by, and nothing even remotely similar to this scenario happened. The people I did say hello to couldn't wait to tell me about their life that revolved around their church. Their church was what gave them and their lives meaning and purpose. The members of the congregation were their friends, their community, their social life. And for me, this was just too bland. There was a plainness to these religious folks that I just couldn't pretend didn't bore me. And it was impossible, therefore, to justify putting any more energy into these friendships, no matter how lonely I still was. I hated how much I hated this town. I hated knowing that there had to be cultiv cultivated and complicated people nearby, but having no idea how to find them. I tried hard to feel grateful instead of miserable. I should have been celebrating the purchase of our first home and my husband's flashy new job that he loved. But 
Just like the glorious weather and the stunning landscape, a big house and impressive job also don't mean a thing if mostly what you feel isn't like an alien. Life hobbled on. Then, one night, after everyone was asleep, it dawned on me to see if Google could help. <laughs> Even though I had no idea where to start, I remember Googling things like liberals in Redlands, secular choirs in Redlands, which at the time there wasn't one. I Googled anything that I thought could possibly hook me up with people who I could have complex conversations with on a variety of topics. I can't remember what other subjects uh, I, tucked in, I typed in, but I do remember that these searches really didn't yield anything for me. So I once again fell flat. Finally, in desperation, and honestly more or less to amuse myself, I googled atheists in Redlands. And to my amazement, up popped something I'd never heard of called the Inland Empire Atheist and Agnostic Meetup Group. It was like midnight at this point. <laughs> what is this? Not only had I never heard of Meetup, I also did not know there was any such thing as an organized atheist and agnostic community. This was a watershed moment for me. The break I was looking for. I even have goosebumps now. <laughs> So I went to bed that night feeling a glimmer of hope for the first time since I moved to Redlands. It was a real, it was a real sense that my life in this small conservative and, conservative and religious town was finally taking a turn for the better. So now it may surprise you that I have no idea that an atheist community existed, but the fact is, before moving to, Red to Redlands, my atheism felt as inconsequential to my life as the fact that I'm left-handed. When I left home for college at the age of 18 in 1987, my belief in God, strictly imposed on me by my Catholic parents while growing up, quickly vanished almost imperceptibly without an ounce of drama. I felt, near, I felt neither relief nor sadness. Basically, with no one forcing religion on me, I dropped it and never once reconsidered my choice. My guess is that God had stopped feeling true for quite some time. But because my parents had made me go to church, receive communion, confess my sins, recite the rosary, there was never a chance to stand back and objectively consider whether what I was being force-fed was good for me or pure garbage. And because as a grown-up, I always lived in large cities like I mentioned before, God was seldom front and center. I was aware that most of my friends believed in God, but he didn't appear to be the driving force in their lives. Mostly, I got the sense that religion had more to do with maintaining traditions and staying connected to their uh, past and their families than, any, than anything else. It felt cultural more than cultish, if you will. Indeed, Redlands was the first time I had ever experienced religion as something that appears to permeate everything. I go to a clinic, and I see a plaque sitting on the uh, check-in desk that says, God bless America. Every other car in Redlands seems to have a bumper sticker on it that is some sort of scripture from the Bible or a dramatic claim that Jesus has all the answers. And occasionally there will be uh, like an instruction not to worry. God knows what he's doing. He's behind the wheel, ha ha ha, and in control. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at one of the schools my son attended, the principal had this religious placard on her desk. Half the teachers wear crosses around their necks. I've seen men two times now giving Bibles away on the sidewalk, inches from my kids' school. At the Home Depot, the checkout person says, God bless you every time to me without fail. 
every time I feel like I should talk to the manager about instructing his or her employees to leave their religious convictions outside the door. The coffee table in the waiting area of my chiropractic practic office has a Bible on it instead of the usual popular rags like people or good housekeeping. The first time I went to market night in Redlands, I was astounded by how many booths there were that related to going to heaven or hell. When I walked into an audition at one of the three community theaters in town, I was handed a sheet of paper a note from the director, which I thought was actually kind of a nice touch. So in the letter, he welcomed us and thanked us for coming to the audition. Then he went on to say that he was confident that God would be at his side during the audition process, that he'd be guiding him throughout the rehearsals as well. I was astounded. Then I learned that this theater also forms prayer circles at the start of each rehearsal. Every single day, no matter how brief my encounter with people, the all-powerful God seems to come up in conversation. Either he is being given full credit for something or relied upon to provide answers for the various dilemmas in their life. All in all, he is a trusted and omnipotent guide who clearly makes them feel more secure and less lonely. What's comical is that in the beginning, I always got a little nervous when God came up because I thought they're gonna ask me about my relationship with God. But to be honest, it didn't take too long before I realized, no, they're not, because they are so sure that I too believe in God. It was just a confident and common assumption. Of course, the weight of all this religiosity lightened significantly once I joined the IEAA. As soon as I felt less alone and supported, the fact that God was everywhere, so to speak, 